Welcome, welcome. Thank you all for coming out tonight and trekking through the rain to get here. I'm Charlotte Duran. I'm a producer here at KPCC with the in-person team. For those of you who are new to KPCC, we are a multi-platform organization. We're on the air at 89.3. We're online at kpcc.org, and we're in person. We do lots of events like this one and other events throughout the community. So if you want to find out more about the events that we do, please check us out, kpcc.org slash in person. Um, you probably also saw note cards on your seats. If you want to connect with us that way, you can become a source for KPCC, a member or volunteer. Um, fill out those note cards and um, give them to one of the a KPCC staffer that you see on your way out tonight, and we'll take those. Um, just a few housekeeping notes before we get started tonight. We are live video streaming, so we ask that you not uh, video record this conversation, but please feel free to take photos. Um, just make sure the flash is off your camera. And also, if you want to connect with us tonight on social, we'll be at KPCC in person. We're using the hashtag ArtsEd. Now I'd like to introduce tonight's host, Carla Javier. Hello, thank you so much for coming out today. Let me just get this set up. All right, as you know, we are here to talk about arts and juvenile justice. And as KPCC's arts education reporter, I have a pretty unique job. You know, I get to go to places and talk to people who aren't normally featured on the news, especially about issues that might not necessarily make it into headlines. And that's what we're gonna do uh, here tonight. One of the topics that I cover pretty in depth is the effort to improve access to arts and arts education. And something that we're gonna bring into that conversation is another effort to change and reform the juvenile justice system from prevention and intervention to experiences when youth are incarcerated and all the way to what happens um, after they are incarcerated and when they return to their communities. LA County's new LA model combines both of these efforts, the effort to Im um, improve and um, increase access to arts education and the uh, efforts to um, think about the way youth are treated when they are incarcerated. Um, so to set the, the background for this conversation for people in the room who uh, might not know, we're gonna be talking about LA County's LA model. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about it a lot, but just to give you enough background to understand uh, what we're talking about, the LA model uh, prioritizes restorative justice and rehabilitation over a more rigid or traditional view of corrections. And as part of this model, artists actually go to the campuses and halls and bring youth arts instruction. That's been happening for a while, but under this new LA model, it's an integral part of the services that is uh, provided for the youth. And I think that's a good place to start our conversation. So I'd like to invite up our first guest. Our first guest is Dave Mitchell with the Los Angeles County Probation Department. He is, <laughs> sorry, I mean to steal your thunder. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, he's the Deputy Director of the Department's Residential Treatment Services Bureau. And uh, Dave, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Um, Dave, you've been at uh, probation for over 30 years. Uh, with your experience, can you tell us a little bit about how this model difference, uh, differs from how the department approached juvenile um, detention incarceration uh, when you first started? Well, I think um, the main difference is that um, this was a true collaborative between the community, the probation department, advocates, uh, the board, um, and an effort and an investment from the board. We received an SB 81 grant to help kickstart the project, um, an investment in doing things differently mm -hmm. in juvenile justice. And we met, and um, one of our guests and I have been on the panel for four to five years planning this mm -hmm. project, the LA model, and we met with community stakeholders, uh, the department, uh, people who had an interest in doing things differently for juvenile justice for four years. And it, they were very intensive meetings. Uh, very purposeful. If you're committed, you you must stay on the committee and stay see see it through its end. Um, the design of the facility is incredible. It looks like a college campus. We call it Campus Kilpatrick. Yeah, you're talking about Kilpatrick. Um, very very stark difference than our other facilities, which are dorm like. Most of our camps are dorm like, or in the juvenile halls, they're locked door facilities. Mm -hmm. These are small cottages where six 
kids live together in a family-like environment. And that's what we're trying to create is a family-like environment where our staff treat kids differently, where we introduce our youth to different type of experiences. That's where the Arts for Incarcerated Youth really come in and give us that exposure and, and teach kids and, and open their minds to culturally sensitive opportunities in the arts and different ways of thinking. We, yeah. Our goal is to change cognition mm -hmm. while the youth are with us. Yeah, and can you talk a little bit more about that? Like what does implementing the arts do in terms of changing the day to day of what probation does with these young people? Well, I think one of the uniquenesses is that these youth probably would not have had this opportunity to be exposed to the arts if they're still in the community. Some of them have not. And in, historically, we have not had the arts as part of our programming. We've had it in um, different camps or different facilities and small pieces, but we made a concerted effort as a department to implement it. They're not only at Campus Kilpatrick, they're in all our juvenile halls and our other camps. And what it does for the youth is it gives them an opportunity to think differently. Mm -hmm. It gives them an opportunity to express um, their feelings differently. And, and it's cathartic for their trauma that they've experienced in their life to express themselves in a less destructive way and a very positive way. Yeah, and um, is there a way that that affects maybe how probation officers interact with the youth, seeing them express themselves through the arts? Absolutely. One of the things we, we, we did from the inception was be very meaningful to train our probation officers with our CBOs. I, Arts for Incarcerated Youth Network was at our training. We, did, we trained all of our staff. We had our mental health therapists there. We had our teachers. We had our nurses. Anyone who was going to address these youth on a day-to-day -day basis were trained together in dialectical behavior therapy, DBT, which is our COG group there, the Missouri model, uh, and, and the arts also did a, a training for us, Kim McGill's group, the Youth Coalition did a training for us. So we wanted everyone to see these youth through the same lens, and we wanted our probation officers to be exposed to the, the arts so they knew how to support AIYN when they came into our facilities. And we wanted them to understand trauma and how the arts can help alleviate some of the trauma in our youth's life. Mm -hmm. I hear you talking a little bit about Campus Kilpatrick. It's a, a facility that I actually got to visit when I first started reporting in this job. But I also want to ask you in terms of rolling out this model elsewhere in the other places that probation works, like what, what, will, be, what will be needed for that? You know, you got to kind of open up a new chapter with, with Kilpatrick. There was a remodel of the literal physical building. How will that look at other probation sites? Well, interestingly enough, we've um, developed a plan to renovate our girls' camp, Camp hmm. Scott, into a small Because Kilpatrick is one for young men. Young men only right now. And, and we, we have a plan to renovate our girls' camp into small cottages. It's going to be different than Kilpatrick because Kilpatrick was torn down and rebuilt. But we're going to use the same tenets of the Kilpatrick model to rebuild an existing building. And that's the department's ultimate goal is to do all of our facilities that way. Um, right now we have less kids in camp than we've ever had, uh, mm -hmm. about 330 kids assigned to our camps. Versus We're, before? Whereas 10 years ago we had 1,500. Oh. So we've done a, you know, a incredible job along with our community partners at trying to serve kids in their natural ecology in the community with their support systems. Because for certain type of kids, if you remove them from your home, from their home, you actually do detriment to them. So we wanted to assure that only our highest risk, highest need kids get removed from their homes, That and there's a community safety aspect to it also. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna bring in a question that we had from a, a listener who wrote in before uh, today. We collected it using this thing called the Harkin Network, the public inside network that we have here at KPCC. Uh, so this question is from Robert, who says he taught creative writing in LA camps and halls for 10 years. I'm going to paraphrase his question a little bit here, but basically it says, uh, he, he, he writes, unit supervisors seemed resistant to creative expression, I guess when he was working in the camps and halls. So he asks uh, why, you, uh, why that might be. And if I can add on to uh, Robert's question here, how do you think implementing this model will or won't change how probation officers work with youth? I think they were resistant because we didn't train them on it. We didn't have comprehensive programming. One of the things that uh, 
Kylie and I discussed was her staff training my staff and on what the importance of the arts and, and Fabian and I were talking about that, how he Folks attend- from the Incar- Arts for Incarcerated yes. Youth Network. And, and so our staff now understand the value of it, understand why we're there doing that and see these kids through a different lens. Um, I think traditionally we've been worried about safety, security, uh, much more aligned with law enforcement than they w- we were uh, rehabilitation and, and for the last 10 to 15 years our departments moving in a direction of rehabilitation and and for years we were aligned with law enforcement structure regimentation we had boot camps and and that did nothing to change the kids cognition it just made them stronger bigger and it was a way to control them but we don't want to control them we want to change them and how are you going to uh, measure or kind of evaluate the outcomes of this LA model to see that, that change? We uh, hired National Council of Crime and Delinquency to do a research, and we've already started the research project from the beginning. Um, we're gonna track kids up to 18 months to look at recidivism. Um, we're looking at not only you know, how the youth do when they leave, but what's the fidelity of what we're doing while they're there? Mm-hmm. Are we sticking to the fidelity of the model. Our kids who get arts better off than kids who don't get arts. Our kids who um, participate in our culinary arts program. We plan to have a garden there. Um, We have a library. We're in talks with the county library to have a full-time librarian there. Really expose these kids to a different lifestyle. And and, but we do have a research project built. Um, We are studying it, study the effectiveness and, and we hope to use that data to support building more facilities like this. As we decline in population, we won't need a lot of facilities. We just need three or four of them like this. And so when kids are removed from their home or have to be removed, we're, we have the most effective environment to treat them. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much, Dave, for joining us. You're welcome. We'll come back to Dave Mitchell in a little bit in a panel discussion, but right now I'd like to introduce our next two guests, Fabian Deborah and Kim McGill. And um, while they're getting set up, I'll tell you a little bit about, about them. Fabian is the Community Connections Director at the Arts for Incarcerated Youth Network. That network actually is, is one that you heard uh, Dave talking about a little bit. It's one of the many organizations involved uh, in the implementation of the LA model. Um, he's also a practicing visual artist. And uh, Kim McGill is an organizer with the Youth Justice Coalition, and she was also a part of um, giving feedback and developing this model. Thank you both for being here. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe we'll start with uh, you, Fabian. Uh, we, we've talked before, you have some firsthand uh, personal experience with the juvenile justice system. And now in your current position as the Community Connections Director, you, you work with youth in the system now. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, your experience and their experience and what they look like from your point of view? I mean, I think, uh, I, I think my mom gave me birth in the proper time, you know what I mean? And, me growing up in, in, in the 80s, there was a, a, a decade of violence and the crack cocaine epidemic. Mm-hmm. And there was, there was not many resources, you know, although as a young one, I discovered art at the age of six. And, I re- and in that moment, I discovered art to be uh, something that gave me hope and it gave me my self-worth amongst all circumstantial barriers that I was raised in. Mm-hmm. And, but when I was getting uh, incarcerated, I got incarcerated at the age of 12 for truancy. I ended up in East Lake Central Juvenile Hall, and then from there I went to Camp Magnier, uh, Camp Gonzalez, and here I am, lost in this uh, system, um, you know, continuing the cycle of my father's drug addiction, et cetera. But mm-hmm. in that time, I remember they had no resources, and I used to love to draw, and I was to make miracles out of a number two pencil. And there was not many uh, staff of support. You know, they wanted us to pursue and follow what it is the program they called at that time. And but there was one probation officer, and I always bring him to life. His name is Dennis Callwood. Dennis Callwood is an African American, and I met him in Camp McNear. And I remember Dennis Callwood did something very important, um, very very important to me. He acknowledged me. He recognized my gift. He recognized my talent. Your, your gift for art. My gift for art. And Mr. Dennis Callwood used to bring in boxes of art materials. And, and, and then he'll say, Fabian, you're not going to play basketball. You're going to stay in. Shh, don't say much. Now get the drawing. 
you know? And so for me, it was like, whoa, damn, this is cool. Like, finally, I get to do something I love. And most importantly, it gave me a sense of relief. At, um, you know, because the, the, at that time, you know, I was already under depression, doing, t you know, just the fact that the incarceration in itself. Mm -hmm. But art gave me that sense of freedom, that sense of hope. And it gave me something that I can utilize as to help me reimagine what my future would look like upon release. And behind my personal life journey, I've been fortunate enough to take those lessons learned and then start to build curriculums and start to put things in place that can actually help also the youth that I come in contact with today mm -hmm. to feel that same effectiveness that I've gained from the arts, you know? Mm -hmm. And thanks to Arts for Incarcerated Youth Network uh, and the fact that they gave me an opportunity to, to be able to come into these facilities and, 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 come and work with the youth, to me, that is how we begin to make this world a safer place. And on another layer, I like the fact that now probation department is paying attention and they're giving us VISTO clearances. Uh, I am a formerly incarcerated individual with a record. I have a background. And sometimes some of the institutions don't allow us in. Now, the probation department, along with the support of Arts for Incarcerated Youth Network, they've been able to turn that page. Mm -hmm. And because we do believe that someone who has been formerly incarcerated brings a cultural competency piece that can be very effective to the, to the youth. We mirror that. They see themselves in me, and, 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 and then we have this other say language that we can tap into that at times is very difficult for the professional to mm -hmm. capture. So that's a valuable experience. Yes, it for is. You. Um, and Kim, you know, you work with with youth with the Youth Justice Coalition, and you also have personal experience uh, with the justice system. From you know, comparing n now and then, what what work do you still think needs to be done aside from you know these new changes in the LA model? Um, well, I not just myself, but the Youth Justice Coalition was part of the process to create the LA model from the beginning. Um, as Mr. Mitchell said, we were part of committees. We had young people and parents on the program committee, and myself and a parent, and when I say parents, these are parents of uh, folks who are either currently in the system or recently in the system. Um, and myself, we were on the staffing and training committee. And it was a difficult process. Uh, we still are in the county that incarcerates more people than any place else in the world. We still have the largest juvenile hall and jail system in the world, the largest sheriff's department and probation departments in the world. And so our goal as the Youth Justice Coalition is to uh, eventually dismantle punishment systems. We know that even young people who spend just a few days inside um, the system are 39% um, less likely to finish high school and 67% more likely to be in prison by the age of 25. And that's when you compare young people who have the exact same demographics and the exact same charges as their peers who don't get incarcerated. So I think running parallel to the creation of Campus Kilpatrick is another um, project that we've been very involved in to divert young people from arrest altogether. And is there a, a role that art can play yes, in Yes, absolutely. So I want to take people into a setting that I was in numerous times that doesn't have the arts and have you imagine yourself as that 12-year-old, that 13-year-old, that 14-year-old that you were in those settings. And you can close your eyes if you want or just imagine if you're listening on the radio. Um, you're in a 10 by 10, sometimes 10 by 20 foot box. It's all cinder block. You have a cement slab coming out of the wall or sometimes a metal shelf really coming out of the wall um, and a tiny mattress about an inch thick. The air conditioning is blasting so you're freezing all the time. Usually you're in there with way too few clothes. Um, some facilities you're in there only with shorts and a t-shirt, and you're locked in at night. So if you have to go to the bathroom, you're pounding on the window and hoping that someone, it is a little tiny sliver of a window, um, and you're hoping that someone will allow you to pee. And oftentimes you're peeing in the corner or you're peeing into a towel, um, and occasionally more than peeing. Um, you remember all the blocks, all the cinder blocks in that room because you count them, you stare at them. You remember if it's a, a room that hasn't been painted, sometimes not in years, you remember all the graffiti. Every smear of excrement or blood um, or dirt, you remember people drawing in the dust. Um, once, I, I, I was here, both here, locked up here in LA County and also in New York, and once um, in New York I was locked up and they didn't realize I had a nickel in my pocket. And I remember covering those walls with scratches in the dirt and dust you made with and paint nickel. with that nickel, yeah. Um, and I think all of that was uncomfortable. The strip searches were uncomfortable. 
Um, the lack of family contact, the lack of programming, all that was uncomfortable. But for me, the worst part of being locked up, whether as a youth or as an adult, is being cut off from imagination. To be told that you're going to be here for hours and days and sometimes weeks without access to a pencil or a, a piece of paper or a journal, without the ability to write down anything, let alone <coughs> draw and paint and imagine. And it's that boredom, it's that um, countless hours of doing nothing that traumatizes, I think, many of us the most. Mm -hmm. um, it makes it very hard to go home um, as the same person. And so for, for people that are inside, if you're not given the arts, you'll create the arts. Um, people make paint out of Kool-Aid. Um, they make paint out of food, uh, keeping food back. They make paint out of the, the capsules that they get medication from. Um, they create art out of every stub of pencil. Um, I, I've known people that have written in the margins and then turned over paper again and again and again to find new pieces of white that they can write on. Um, people get good at rhyming because you commit to memory every line you create. Um, you talk to each other in rhymes. Um, you become a great storyteller. And even if you're in the, the jail cell um, behind the county jail or you're going through processing in the county jail or you're in court waiting to go into the courtroom and you're with people that you've never met before. It's that storytelling and that art that gets you through that day. Hmm. Um, so I think that you can, you can keep people away from art materials, but it's art that keeps us alive. Um, and it's art is like essential to our fight back. So for us at the Youth Justice Coalition, we organize to transform the system and to um, dismantle the system and create youth development in communities. And the arts is integral to that movement building work because organizing without the arts is also not liberating. Hmm. So I want to go back to you, Fabian, just to follow on that because you actually you go to campus Kilpatrick now. You you bring arts you know workshops and instruction to the youth there. Um, can you talk about a time where you've seen that really make a difference in a young person's? I think I think just the fact that we are able to come in <clears throat> and build relationship with the youth that the, the transformation already begins on my, from my perspective. Um, currently, I'm in uh, Campus Kil Kilpatrick once a week, and we're trying to develop a pre-release as a AIYN. We're trying to do the pre-release efforts. Um, building and can you explain what pre-release means? Pre-release is like uh, pre-release is getting them ready and prepared so building stability so when they come home that they already have some sort of a blueprint or some sort of vision of what the reentry is going to look like. And so what we do is bring per, uh, personal development courses. We start to uh, dialogue and take them into a conversation of like moving them beyond the mindset, you know, building confidence and so on and so forth. But for me, since art is my strength, I utilize art as the language. Mm -hmm. And I think I can gain a lot more from them by utilizing these art workshops. Now, not every week is an art workshop, but it, it leads to, to that. I feel that the art is a more subtle approach, a more safe way to get them to a vulnerable state, which then allows them to move beyond that. And when you say a more safe way, what, what do you mean? I think. Um, Somehow there's a stigma at times and because they've been told what to do constantly, whether it's through a mental health therapist, whether it's through probation, whether it's through a staff member, whomever, I think art, it's, it's a subtle approach in a way that it doesn't come with that, that, that um, you know, I will say traditional, not traditional, what, what that type of uh, stigma, you get me? It's hard to explain, but I, 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 Anyway, so for me, art is a more subtle approach. It allows me to take them to a place of vulnerability that at times maybe doesn't come from a, of a, a very technical approach where this is what you know anger and resentment looks like. And we're, no, I'd rather utilize art and have them you know, lead the way and take me to but a how place. But how does art do that? Art, accordingly to the way the, the art workshops are tailored, you know, I mean, we have to be intentional when we create these art workshops that is going to help provoke that and emotion. And so for me, if I'm thinking about the subculture that exists, which is gang culture, I have to understand that there's a certain belief system that has been embedded in them. And it's very difficult at times to get them to move from one place to another due to the gang ties. And so then I would have to then think, what is something that is familiar with them, that they are so familiar with in their circumstances, and utilize their surroundings to inform me to help them to look beyond 
what that looks like. See, the, the environment informs my workshops. The youth inform my workshops. They're pretty much guiding me, and all I'm doing is intentionally tailoring the workshops to m make it that much more impactful. So say for example, and I think I can share now about one of yeah, the sure. images. So for example, if we're in a camp, this is just a little something how I tailor our workshops, right? Or whatever the conversation is gonna lead to. So if we're in a, if we're in a in campus, and there tend to be cinder walls, right? The wall. And so I say, how can I utilize that wall to help me tailor this art workshop? How can I help the youth look beyond that wall? And so then there's an art workshop that I put together, which is the cylinder block wall. And on that wall, I was able to tell the youth, there are certain things we carry and that keeps us from looking beyond that wall or at times from moving to a better place. If you had a marker, a pencil, what are some of those words you would put on that cylinder wall? Anger, resentment, betrayal, grief, loss, all that. Okay, now, which one is the one that is the most heaviest to you? Grief. Okay, so let's remove that block. And once they take that break symbolically, they remove that block, now you can start to look beyond the wall. And so then in this place, I, I decided to do this, and it's mainly like, a, I'll share a little bit of, of what that looks like. Now initially there was a kid that, at times the world might perceive him to say, he's the toughest gang member, there's no, there's no hope for that kid, and he is. He acted like a little tough gang member when I first came in contact with him. And that's, that's, that's what would happen. You know, they're gonna posture, gesture, defense me mechanisms go up because I'm not gonna show you who I really am, right? That's their defense mechanism. So eventually, because of my experience, I was able to <clears throat> talk to the youth, and he, in the first workshop, he started to do gang writing. My barrio, primero, y que, and all that, right? And so, what does he expect? Don't be doing that. That's gang writing. As a matter of fact, you're not gonna come to my workshop next week. That's what you That's would what think he would expect. That's what he probably expects, because he's been excluded previously from his own loved ones or whoever that may be. But me, I say, Huh, that's interesting, because that might be his reality, so I need to be mindful of that. And actually, to me, that's the point of entry to get him closer. So this kid who was tough, the world perceives him to be the no hope for him. Eventually, because of the consistency that we have and the relationship we've built in the Campus Kelly Patrick as Arts for Incarcerated Youth Network, I was able to take him to a, a, another state. So here, he was able to look beyond the wall. And this drawing might be simple, you know, I'm not trying to make. Can you describe it a bit? It might be hard to see. Okay, so this drawing, it's, it's, a, it's a hand holding a flower. And this is that kid that the world perceives to not be able to change or what have you. And the kid that was giving me a hard time initially, no hard time, just, you know, closed off or what have you. So now in the fifth week, this is the drawing that he did as he looked beyond the brick wall. And what he did, he went from my barrio y todo, primero, all that, to, 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 to this, and this is the beauty, and this is why I do this type of work, because I was able to see the, the, the dial move just a bit, and then he said, when I look beyond the wall, I see all red, which represents all the sins that I committed. He goes, yet the flower in this picture represents the beautiful things I've done in my entire life. The hand holding the flower is that of my mother, always carrying and holding me. The blue ribbon represents her life, knowing that once she lives this world, she is going to let go of the flower, which is me. That's when I need to have, that's when I need to learn to become a man. And something as simple as this, as basic as this, I'm not trying to make Diego Rivera's of, 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 of <laughs> out of this class. It's not so much about that. Now, if they do, great. That's just the icing on the cake. The whole point is to utilize art as a language, as a vehicle, to help them to think differently, to express themselves without judgment. Art does that. It's a very subtle approach, but very effective. And the kid that was perceived to be the toughest little gang member, troublemaker, or what have you, just gave me a glimpse of who he really is. Get me? Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing. I want to bring in a couple questions that people had prepared, uh, sent in to me through our PIN network. Um, uh, the first thing is from someone named Maria who wrote in 
and asked, you know, in regard to the arts programming, incarcerated youth receive something like what Fabian was just talking about at Kilpatrick. Is there a focus on providing art job skills that can be used for employment? And I want to broaden that out a little bit to like outside of when people are system involved. Do you, either of you have a thought on um, their, the arts and their involvement in their lives? Um, Kim, do you want to start? Well, one is that I think we have to integrate the arts into everything that we do. Um, so for us, we connect young people to organizing opportunities, public policy opportunities. They go to Sacramento regularly. They write their own legislation and carry it, or they work with other groups to carry legislation and laws at the local level, um, push for changes at the city and county level. And throughout all of that, I think arts is really essential. So young people are learning social media skills, um, how to create memes, flyers, posters, wheat pasting, murals in the community that people can look to um, for inspiration. Uh, they do on, a lot of online work around um, creating websites or, or social media, um, Facebook and MySpace, filling it. Um, I'm not MySpace so much anymore, although some people are sure. on MySpace, <laughs> but it still exists. <laughs> um, and then also um, in terms of Instagram and Snapchat. And then also connecting them to um, the arts through their, through their actual actions. So an example of that would be young people were protesting the jail expansion. We have a $3.7 billion jail expansion plan for LA County at a time when our uh, crime and rest rates are at their lowest level since the 1950s. And young people have been fighting that along with others um, at their side. And so one of the things they did was they went to um, uh, Mira Loma, which is the planned location for the jail, to collect dirt to show that it was saturated with um, valley fever and also other toxins from that being a military base. But they wanted to do it in a, in a way that would provoke people's imaginations mm -hmm. and inspire creativity. So they went in hazmat suits, collected the dirt, videotaped it, and then brought the, the dirt back in little jars with hazmat like symbols on it and tried to give it to the Board of Supervisors and watched as justice deputies and others said, no, nah, wow. they wouldn't even touch it. Um, they went oh, wow. to the meetings in hazmat suits and then they eventually went to the Board of Supervisors actually in hazmat suits with huge murals and banners and stuff created also. Um, another example would be um, at Halloween. Um, they created masks of um, animals and, and the whole theme of that day was like, we're not animals to bring about the fact that um, LA County and LA City spend more to protect stray dogs than they do to protect young people from violence. Um, and went into the Board of Supervisors with their um, homemade masks, their faces painted. Again, they've done a lot of um, work to create their mask and their face paint um, and dressed in um, prison or jail um, gear. Um, as if to say that when you build these jails, you're building them for us. You know, So just a much more creative way to engage the board and then Rather than just signing up for public comment as usual, they did poetry from their seats. They did mm. speeches from their seats. They shut down the board meeting. Um, and the board eventually left, but had to first engage with young people in a very different way. So those are just two examples of how the arts is integrated into organizing and action. And then on top of that, there's tons of folks in the community, um, in the media world, in the entertainment industry, um, in the visual arts world that are training people coming home from prison, coming home from juvenile halls and camps. Um, to get real jobs in media and in the arts. And I think that's something that's always happened in LA and has been there since that the very beginning. economy. Right, but is much more expanded now. Um, as people are pushing for alternatives to incarceration, more and more resources are making it to the ground for those kind of programs. Mm -hmm. And then to follow on that, I mean, Fabian, you, you see people you know, once a week at Kilpatrick, but you, you've mentioned you also see them in the community Oh, yeah, um, afterwards, can you talk a little bit about that connection and that part of it? Well, we're currently, uh, uh, as the community connection director, the, my main efforts is reentry and diversion. And um, right now, because of the fact that we're building uh, relationships prior to their release, but I gotta give a shout out to all the members from Arts for Incarcerated Youth Network because a lot of them already been, we we're already in all the facilities. And when you're talking about the members, you're talking about arts organizations. Arts right? organizations um, that are under the umbrella of Arts for Incarcerated Youth Network, the collaborative body. And I think for me, uh, they bring a lot of the different, the exposure of the art disciplines already. So the youth already getting their feet wet and an introduction of the different pathways that exist within the arts. And I think for me with that, it's my responsibility and duty to be able to call to action the community partners. You know, we do have a lot of uh, 
high-end institutions in Los Angeles, you know, such as LACMA, MOCA, The Broad, and Los Angeles Municipal Art Gallery. And I think a lot of them do want to help, but they just probably don't know how. I've been told that. And so for, <coughs> I, I, I've been told that. And so, good, you're in luck then, because you got the bridge right here, right? So that's what I always say. And so, but that's the thing, though. It, like, for me, it's about how do we elevate and give these youth a professional life experience. So we no longer continue to check that box where it just means we just had him here for a hundred and whatever hours. You know, I want to really elevate them to a, a much better place. And I think the high-end institutions are doing so. So we already have some youth who are now being um, introduced to policy and advocacy as well. Gradually, we're feeding them slowly, you know, and now we're also working with uh, Weed Axe right now, where we're trying to get some paid internships. Working uh, with what? Sorry. Weed Axe, it's a, it's a county, right? Yeah. 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 The employment arm of the county. Yeah, exactly. So we're working with them so that we can get these youth paid internships as well. And me, I'm just building bridges amongst community with the hopes that we can land them and put them in the <coughs> in the creative economy pathway, whether it's visuals, whether it's writing, whatever it is that you know their interest may be. And I believe it's, it, it it can work. You know, I mean, someone gave me the opportunity. Like I'm a I'm. A, and everything is based off my personal life. It's not all about me, and sh I'm not trying to do all that. But, but, but the truth is, like, someone gave me an opportunity. I'm a visual artist. Someone believed in me when I was young. Someone gave me a platform so that I can speak my mind and carry over my voice. And today, I'm able to get into these high-end institutions because of my visuals and my creative merits. And it's amazing because it's like, wow, there is a place for Fabian. And so that must tell me that there is a place for all these youth if guided properly. And that's the thing. It takes a community effort in order to make this world a safer place. And today, since we're here, if you're, since I'm, I'm just doing a quick little pitch, but since I'm the community connection director, if you're out there and you have an organization or an institution that is willing to open the door and help me bring some of these youth in, feel free to look, look us up. And I'm always willing and able to come and see you and we can begin the dialogue of creating more pathways for my youth. I would just add to that too to put a plug in for that effort that um, the county or the city and there's many programs that you can tap into can pay for that first 120 hours but really urge you to hire the young people afterwards and keep them on and give them more of a permanent home in the arts so it's it's longer than that 120. And, and, and what role does the do the arts organizations, the members of the Arts for Incarcerated Youth Network, have in kind of continuing the relationship with these young people? Do you know, is it too early to know, or do you do you know? Well, the I'm sorry, to I say didn't. I didn't. <laughs> the the arts organizations that are part of Arts for Incarcerated Youth existed even before the network did. Right. Many of them have been working with system impacted youth for decades now. Um, they have a they have roots in L. A. Um, in L. A. County and in, in L. A. City in the very communities where young people are coming home to. So whether it's um, Tia Chucha's uh, Cultural Cafe in, in Pacoima, or um, Street Poets in South Central LA, or all the muralists that are working in the East Side, um, they, they've, they're part of the roots of LA. And I would say that the, the opportunity as well as the responsibility for the rest of LA is that LA is 15% white, but the arts, the inter entertainment industry, the arts that gets the big money, is dominated by white-owned um, galleries, by white-controlled museums, by, a, by an, a Hollywood industry that's getting more diverse in front of the camera, but is still almost entirely white and male behind the camera. And so the shout out is not just to the, the arts organizations that are already rooted and are holding on against all odds, um, being very small grassroots organizations in their communities, but also can, how can the larger art world give back and reverse those that decades, as hundreds of years of of racism and um, structural barriers that kept not only system impacted people out, formerly incarcerated people out, our families out, but kept really majority black and brown and even women out of the out of the industry. So to me, that's really the responsibility of LA being the birthplace of you know modern entertainment and, and still kind of the epicenter for it. Uh, what does it mean to really uh, reach back and and reverse uh, that decades, centuries long um, discrimination? And, and just to follow on something that you said, you know, you, you mentioned, and you're absolutely right, that these organizations have been doing work with system impacted youth for, for a while, even before this LA model came out. But do, do either of you see a, a difference in that, the way those workshops are rolling out or the effects on youth now that it's something that's embedded into the work that probation does? 
Do I see it? <laughs> do I see a difference in yeah. comparisons to what? To when maybe it wasn't as embedded in the LA model. Uh, when big things. time. I mean, it was been overdue, you know, and and that's why I said that like for me to be partake in this and was taking places like oh they caught on they caught up to the traditional arts they work this has been going on for centuries but now they finally caught on and to me i've seen a major difference and i think that uh now they're more receptive and to see probation partake in some of these uh trainings themselves that's telling me that there is a, the the you know the page is turning and i think we just need to enhance on that and continue to build on that so that this way, eventually, then we can reform all camps into campuses, you know? Um, but there is a major difference, and I can see it in the, in the youth, in the youth, and how they're being cared for in such way. It's not like, like the way it was when I was there, so yeah. Can I just push on that a bit? A bit? Like, what differences are you, what are you seeing? It might be hard for people to imagine. I mean, just the fact that I'm able to come in. Let's just start there. The fact that there is a person who had a record and someone who a formerly incarcerated ex-gang member who was able to come in into the institution, that's huge. You know, that's just one element. And the fact that the kids have people that they can see themselves in, to me, that's huge as well. And and they're being, um, they're being cared for in such different way. You know, they're, re they're being um, acknowledged and respected as they should have been when I was a child, when I was a youth. And, and to me, that, 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 that it's very different. And, and I'm happy to see that, it's getting to, that, is, that we're living in those times now. But there's still a lot of work ahead of us, don't get me wrong, you know what I mean? And, and I just wanna bring us back to that original image that I gave of what it was like to be in that cell, that cinder block cell, freezing. That's still the reality for young people every night in our juvenile halls. It's still the reality in our camps that majority of the young people are in a dorm setting. Um, it's still, when you walk into facilities, and still, I think it's getting better in terms of murals covering some of these, but where the walls are institutional colors that not only subdue your imagination, but subdue your resilience, your ability to fight back against very unjust conditions, and where the rules on the wall are all about containment and control. And so I think it's important that the arts are coming in but it's also about how can we use the arts to free ourselves from that kind of vision for public safety in LA County and beyond. Because all over the world, people are dismantling prisons. There's a movement across the country and across the world to end youth incarceration. Um, Mr. Mitchell already said that we're at 300 some people in the camps, um, down from 1,000. And when YJC first started, there was almost 4,000 youth every day. And that wasn't very long ago. That's just in the, you know, the mid 2000s. Um, 4,000 youth every day, 2,000 in camps, 2,000 in halls. And so now we have the lowest crime rate again, I said this already, but um, since the 1950s, this is our opportunity to end youth incarceration and to really do what the, what the evidence tells us and also what our own personal experiences tells us, that, that we should not be defined by our one worst act or defined by our, our worst or most debilitating trauma, but really seen by what are our dreams and how do we have a youth development approach and that means investing in a youth development department, which has just been created in LA County, and moving toward a youth development structure for all young people, but especially for system impacted young people. And in youth development, the arts are a key component of that, along with education and career um, readiness and mental and physical health um, and recreation, uh, as well as civic engagement, um, learning how to organize and be able to uh, imagine and create the world around you. So. I want to talk about this more when we bring Dave Mitchell back up in a little bit. But first, I actually want to pivot to one of Fabian's colleagues, Kylie, who's here in the front row. Um, Kylie is the executive director of this Arts for Incarcerated Youth Network that you've been hearing a lot about tonight. Um, and uh, Kylie was just at Create Justice, which is uh, uh, an event that was held here. But she was in New York for, I think it's third part. Is that right? Part three. Uh, to talk uh, with uh, arts organizations, um, justice, you know, uh, minded organizations from around the country. So I, um, Kylie, feel free to stand up. Um, and I want to ask you a little bit in terms of, we were having this conversation about LA, LA County, LA County probation. Can you uh, give us a little sense of what this, how this compares, you know, in terms of what people are doing around the country? Absolutely, um, and, and I do want to actually build on uh, what Fabian and, and Kim were saying too, that these are arts organizations that have been around for a long time and that came together to form the network, and, and our members are uh, the Actors Gang, 
the Armory Center for the Arts, Artworks LA, uh, the Boyle Heights Arts Conservatory, Dance for Healing, I have to do this alphabetically, sorry, uh, Gay Men's <laughs> Chorus of Los Angeles, uh, Jail Guitar Doors, Rhythm Arts Alliance, Street Poets, Unusual Suspects Theater Company, and Right Girl, also known as Bald Ink. So it's a tremendous uh, collection of organizations that just have uh, you know, a really diverse strengths of art disciplines. Um, that are bringing in and hopefully gives you a sense of, of, of the scope of our, our members. And they and don't just provide services for incarcerated youth. Those are no, organizations that I find in my reporting. Exactly. Often. They, they often do a lot of work in the community. So as, as Kim said, they, they have really deep roots in, in the community uh, as, as well, which is, which is fantastic. What's it been exciting um, here in LA has been this, this integration uh, into, into the probation facilities. And I think it's brought a sense of consistency also, uh, for the young people there, that it's not like something, a program that comes in and then goes out. Um, this has enabled us to stabilize the programming, which I think especially with this uh, population is really important to provide the stability and the continuity. Um, it's also been stabilizing for staff, uh, which has had- Probation staff. Probation staff, which has had interesting uh, uh, benefits as well, um, which I think has helped made things smoother. And, and as you said, I, I think that all of it is, is connected to uh, an increased attention to the importance of centering the arts um, as a way to, the thing that's really cool about the arts is that when you're really talking about justice systems, especially for young people, they are systems that are designed to divide and to exclude and to control. And what the arts are really, really, really good at is including. Um, and collaborating, um, and, and I think that's part of why it's such an effective strategy. Um, so what we're finding is that this is, this is happening in LA. I think LA is, is at the leading edge of it. The leading edge. The leading edge, um, but it's not alone, um, which is really wonderful. We're seeing uh, in New York similar uh, investment in arts as a way to uh, as, as an intervention and also an early uh, uh, prevention strategy. It's a way to build community strength. It's a way to build public safety. Um, we had a whole contingent from Chicago, from Philadelphia, from Boston, uh, increased interest from Nashville, and, and my favorite is Paint Lake, Kentucky, yep. um, <laughs> which um, was, was fantastic because it also brought out a, a conversation about urban versus rural mm -hmm. um, and, and the need, uh, how, how arts uh, also provides a way to engage in communities that maybe don't have a history of organizing, um, but it is a way to, to lift up uh, and shed light on and also to, to, to humanize in a way that feels accessible. And, and did you hear conversation of people talking about things they would want to learn from the way LA has done this or? Um, Absolutely, like yeah. What's been exciting is I think that we've, we've created a, a model to think about um, how grassroots organizations um, of all sizes, I mean, we've got uh, the whole range in, in the network, um, can partner with public agencies. Um, and that's been really exciting. I think it's enabled us to access public dollars that weren't coming to the arts before. Um, it's, it's provided a, a way to get some of that money to the community um, much more effectively and, and has created, I, I think, a true partnership too that's helped uh, sort of on both sides of that equation and that's been exciting. And so we've heard a lot of interest um, around how can, we, how can we bring that to other communities um, as a way to lift up some of those community arts organizations and, and organizing organizations um, to, to work in partnership to transform some of those systems. And I also just wanted to ask you, you know, we've been talking about this work at Kilpatrick in a lot of our conversation here and with Dave, but I was wondering if you can give us a sense of um, the work that your organization, uh, how much of this work your organization is doing in probation camps and halls. I would love to do that. Um, we're in all of them. We're in all of the uh, juvenile detention camps. We're in all of the juvenile halls. We are in all of what are called the juvenile day reporting centers. There's five of them, um, probation run schools in the communities, um, providing 90 minute art classes twice a week um, at every facility in 12 week cycles year round. Um, and, and, and that's amazing. Um, so we're really, really proud of that. And in my reporting, rare, just in general, for a student to have you know, that much access to arts education. Yeah, and so that's part of where we're saying if this, if this works here, how, how important it is to invest in that as a prevention strategy uh, in the first place. So thank you, Kylie. You're welcome. 
So now what I'd like to do is bring Dave Mitchell back to the stage and have a, a conversation with all of us here. And I know there are some folks in the audience who probably have some questions who've been writing down some things. We'll definitely leave time for that, uh, but we're gonna have a little conversation here first. So uh, in response to, to my reporting, uh, you know, I cover arts education. A lot of people ask me, have asked me when I was preparing for this panel, you know, out of all the different things that probation could provide to young people when young people are in their care, why build the arts into that model and why dedicate the resources to that? Um, Dave, how does this support a bigger picture for these youth? I think, um, like I alluded to earlier, it's really about changing their thinking and, and the arts are a vehicle to change their thinking. Um, Kids do not change when they get to the community unless we've impacted the way they think when they got into our care. And, and, and cognition is incredible that they, they have to see themselves differently, and I think the arts give them that opportunity also see themselves- Internally. Internally in a different role, but also to think about, I mean, the metamorphosis of that picture from what he drew first when he came in was his placa to what he, you know, Drew, when he left, that meant that he had internalized Fabian's lessons. And that's our goal, is to change the way they think. These kids have it in them. They're smart kids, they're creative. Oftentimes they don't have the opportunities, they're educationally deficient, and they've already been pigeonholed in a certain area. The arts give them an opportunity to shine where they may not have had success in the community. And um, do, do either of you have any other thoughts? On that. Well, I just wanted to expand a little bit on what I was saying about youth development. Um, there is a real field of youth development. We just haven't seen it in LA County. Um, it's, it's ancient too. Um, you know, New York, Philadelphia, um, Boston was doing it in the 1800s um, when a lot of young people were pouring into the streets from all over the world as immigrant youth. And meanwhile, in LA County, we were investing in suppression and even then had the highest lynching rate and beginning to have the highest incarceration rates in the nation. And I think that's kind of the un untold story about LA and why we've become the epicenter for punishment as opposed to an epicenter for youth and community development. So when you look at youth development, which again is a real field, very you know becoming ancient, and around the world it's also even more um, widespread and, and more developed, the arts are a key component of youth and human development. Um, it, it gives people an opportunity to imagine a reality beyond what they see. It gives people an opportunity to heal from the trauma or the anger that they faced. Um, we use this thing that came out of Brazil called, um, some, some people call it legislative theater. It, it's built out of um, Paulo Freire's teachings, um, but taken up by um, Augusto Boal when he was alive. And what young people do, or, or anybody in the community does, is they act out their reality, and then you freeze the scene, and then other people can step in and act out a new reality. How would they solve that differently? Oh, as a technique. It's, it's, yeah, but it's really integrating the arts into problem solving. Um, we also use the arts a lot in transformative justice. When people are having conflict with each other, or when one party's harmed and another person or another group of people is accused of doing the harm, you can get into a, like a logical, mental conversation about what's happened, but when people can go beyond that to integrate the arts and feelings into that, then it leads to a whole different transformation. One, it enables people to really step inside the shoes or the experiences of the other party or the other person. Um, and then it, it enables people to really apologize or take responsibility to also talk about how they've been hurt and for the whole community to come together and see things differently. And I don't think that's possible. That kind of reimagining is not possible unless you use writing, um, creativity, um, drama, visual arts to make it happen. I see that as a common thread almost in the way that both of you were thinking about the arts as transformative as a, as a personal, personal effect. Um, another thing I wanted to ask y'all while you were all here is, you know, all of the organizations that you, you work with or you're representing today were part of the conversation and development of this LA model that we're talking about and the arts as part of that model. But I wanna ask you what you would say to someone who would push back on that, these ideas that we've been talking to, about, who would push back and say maybe it's too expensive or approaching juvenile justice this way is not rigid or punitive enough. I, I'll, I'll take the first shot at that, and I think Kim may agree. It's more expensive to incarcerate youth than to invest in them, and especially in, in the prevention efforts and, and rehabilitation. 
So as we've reduced our numbers, you know, we can utilize some of those resources to provide what the kids need, whether it's in the community, um, in our facilities. But it, it, I think we're real short-sighted when it comes to prevention and, and programs like this that may not have the evidence behind them that, that they're, they work because you have to do them long enough to gather that evidence. And, and you have to be able to take a leap of faith that you can invest in this so you can continue to reduce the number of youth who are removed from their home. <laughs> um, well, I just want to give folks some figures because if I was out there in the audience right now, I would be snatching your cell phones and taking your purses and maybe you know, just like looking for what I can take, like right here, like, man, I really like this picture actually. I'm going to take that because I know it's special to you. And, and the reason I would do that is just to, to emphasize that even those of us who've been locked up or our family members, it may seem like we're the ones paying the price behind kind of a, a punishment industry. But in reality, all of you are. Um, just some, some statistics, and these are 2015 numbers. So I could get out the most recent numbers to you, which we're compiling now, um, because it's gone up from this. But in 2015, um, we spent $2,115 per arrest for a young person in LA County. That's just for the arrest. That's just the policing booking charges, right? And then $3,394 for each day they spend in court, which for most, most of the time, whether you're a youth or adult, is a few minutes before the judge. It's all the transportation, all the staffing, all the, it's just um, all of that. For every day that they were in camp, 200, and, I mean for every year that they were in camp, a probation camp, $247,000, 247,236 dollars per youth per year in camp. And again, it's higher now than it was two years ago. And then for every year in juvenile hall, one young person, $281,327 for each young person. So if I'm out there taking your wallet, taking your chains, taking your cars, whatever, whatever, what I'm trying to illustrate is that we're allowing the city and county to invest heavily in suppression at the expense of everything your communities need, as parks, playgrounds, jobs programs, after school programs, a youth development department that infuses the arts into young people everywhere. So we have 300 young people in camps and about 700 young people in juvenile halls that are just beginning to get youth development. We have the largest number of young people in the country between the ages of 10 and 21, most of which never see youth development. So to me, I think it's interesting that it's happening like this, but hopefully we can go backwards and have what we're doing for young people in lockup just recently to eventually happen in the streets for all young people and know that youth development is needed for all youth. Um, I think the other thing that's happening that's very exciting is how can we divert young people from the system altogether? And there's another model that just got launched this week that many of us worked on for a couple of years also that will divert as many as 11,000 young people away from arrest every year. So they won't even be booked or fingerprinted or have any kind of criminal index. There's another thing that's happening this month, which is the elimination of WIC 236. That's the ability of probation officers to work with young people who haven't even been court involved yet. We had 17,000 youth two years ago and last year 21,000 youth in LA, in LA County that were reporting to probation officers for things like grades and school attendance that had never been to court. Because again, that's a very much more expensive punitive model as opposed to really investing in youth development. So to me, let's take what Fabian's doing and make it countywide. Let's make it happen in every school, in every neighborhood. Make sure that young people get it when they're locked up, but more importantly, move toward a county where we're not locking young people up at all. It's very possible. It's right there. You can see it. You can feel it. You can grab it. And we need all of your help to do it. And not just for the young people that are getting into the system, but for all of your young people that you can't afford to get through an arts program or a park or playground or get into college because those resources don't exist in your community. Can we? I, I want to ask a little bit about um, what the, the plausibility of that. I mean, Dave, I'm not sure if you have a thought of that or the, the, what way it would take uh, to, to get there, if that's where probation is headed or going. Well, I think it um, takes several things. Number one is resources. It, it takes uh, changing. It takes success, um, replication, uh, political will. Um, it takes uh, changing of the role of probation, and, and, and we began that process years ago, and, and, and we're, 
we're there. We're not as far along as, as we should be. And, and, and our role is going to change in the community. Our role, you know, we really should be navigators for youth and, and get them to the right services that they need um, and, and, you know, work in a different way. And, and, and like I said, it, it, it takes a lot of political will and money to do this. And you have to believe that investing in prevention, keeping kids out of the system, is the best policy. And you have to give it time to take hold. And um, I'll, I'll bring in a question from a listener that uh, kind of talks a little bit about these themes that we're discussing right now. Um, Allison wrote, there's a raggedy timeline of movement in the juvenile justice system. How do we provide long-term continuity in programming, court order to release, and beyond? Maybe Fabian, with your experience working with youth you know, at Kilpatrick and then afterwards, can you speak to that? I mean, <clears throat> What, what, what do we, uh, see sometimes as a society we raise the expectation bar on the youth so high up that even I get sick of trying to reach that myself, right? So I think for me personally it's like what are we really doing as a community? I think we can say, you know, it, I guess the continuum is very important. I think we need to, re investment is very important. I'm, I'm just gonna be myself then. I'm, I'm trying to like, trying to figure it out. But like, we just need to, seriously, we just need to invest in people. A lot of these youth are coming back to these communities of poverty. Uh, and, and, and at the same token, we're trying to elevate the minds of these youth, but let's be realistic. I wanna proceed and become and do what it is you're calling me to do, but my circumstantial barriers don't allow it to. And so how do we um, build resiliency in these youth enough so that we don't re-traumatize them. Because on the one hand, I need you all to help me give them the end result. Because in the end of the day, what I do is come in and I give them hope. I, I sell them hope in a way. And if the, if the end result's not there from the community, I just re-traumatize them. And the 10 steps he took forward with the hopes of redirecting his life, he's gonna take about 40 steps right back. And so how do we put those things in place so that the kid can, get a sense of relief, and we as the adults should be dealing with those responsibilities that a youth should not be carrying, and this way he won't re-offend. And, and I think for me, that's what it takes. It just takes a community effort to be able to take the risk. If this is your community and they're part of the fabric, then what are we doing as adults and community members to open that door wider so that these kids can have a more stable sp place and don't re-offend? A lot of these kids don't have a father figure. A lot of these kids don't have mothers. They come from intergenerational drug addiction. So if we can play the role of that father figure, then why not? It is easier to point fingers at times, because that's what society has a tendency to do, than to hold oneself accountable and put their grain of salt into this change and try to have make this world a safer place. So, the, and I get it, there's no resources. Sometimes I get frustrated at times because, you know, it's like if you follow step A, B, C, and D, this is what it can look like. <laughs> Shit, it's not there, what's up, help me. You know, it's that we can't just do it on our own. So what are you doing, if you have access, if you have, if you have access and resources and are capable of giving my youth an opportunity, then take that risk. It's a risk well taken. So I'm gonna follow on that a little bit because I'm a reporter and I think about feasibility, access, resources. Dave, you were saying, um, you know, probation's gonna change a little bit about it's, you know, what, what it does. I mean, is all of that on probation or, uh, you know, what role would probation have? In Absolutely that? not. I mean, we, we're the vehicle that ki gets these kids through the system, but we're, we're only as strong as our support systems, whether it's community, whether it's the board, whether it's mental health. Um, it's not, probation isn't the panacea for these kids. The community is the panacea and working with the community and, and surrounding these kids and families with support. Um, there's so many, I mean, these kids, 70% of them have mental health issues when they come to us. Another 85 have been involved in DCFS, either referred or been a client of DCFS. Uh, education, they come in with the average of about a fifth or sixth grade reading level when they come to our, our juvenile halls and camps. 
And, and so there's a lot of responsibility before they even come to us. Mm. And, and I would love to be out of a job. I mean, I, I, I would love to see us invest in the front end services, um, invest in what these youth need, the youth development that Kim speaks, speaks to. Um, there, there has to be a concerted effort. And, and the last thing is we need to study what we do because data, when, when money gets tight, and we all know it's gonna get tight again one day, you know, data speaks volumes, and research speaks volumes. So, you know, we have to have a comprehensive plan to study what we're doing, to make sure it works, and to be able to sell that when resources diminish. I would just um, add a few, like, concrete things that I think everyone in LA should really fight for, and not just fight for countywide, but fight for in the communities where you live. Um, one is that we need a back to the future model in many ways. Because if we go back to 1980, we only had 12 prisons in, LA, in uh, California. Um, we had much less young people um, starting to cycle into the system, but still at that point in the system. Um, and in, since that time, we've built um, 22 state prisons and four universities. Um, so that's the first thing to just point out. How can we get back not to our current numbers, because we're celebrating a lot the fact that we're downsizing the, the youth system and downsizing the adult system, and then in the adult state prison system, for example, we've gone from 171,000 people down to about 121,000. But how do we get back to about the 36,000 or less than we were in 1980? Similarly, back to the future, um, Mr. Mitchell's an MSW. He came into the department at a time when most people that came in were social workers. If you look internationally at what's happening in young people that are in conflict with the law, they go into systems if they go in at all and meet social workers or youth workers or coaches or artists. But in our system, we took a turn, not just in LA County, although LA County led and exported it to the rest of the nation, but we took a turn nationwide and suddenly had people going through, and we still do this, criminal justice and juvenile justice programs at the community college or the Cal State level, and then come in. They wear uniforms now. This is also a new phenomenon in LA County and is again spread um, across the country so that you come in and you see people in, in military style or police style boots, um, khakis, tucked in um, shirts with a badge sewn into the shirt, um, women in buns, and I talked to someone recently who went to a probation graduation and said it felt to her exactly like a Quantico graduation or a, or a graduation from the LA Police Academy. Um, and so we wanna move back to where Mr. Mitchell was when he came in, where social workers ran the system. And I know that unions are concerned about downsizing. We're, at Youth Justice Coalition, we want union wages. We want public jobs for people. We want living wage dignified careers. But we could replace everyone who retires, who leaves the career with, a, with someone else that's not the same job description. We don't have to replace people with DPOs, you know, deputy probation officers. Um, we even have armed probation officers in our department. We don't need that. But what we could replace them with is coaches, artists, social workers, counselors, et cetera. Um, if I can just a couple more minutes, does that have time? Um, I want to get to uh, audience questions. I want to make sure I can ask a couple okay. bit more. I'll do it real, real quick. Is that cool? All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I just want to point out is that um, if we took just 5% of our law enforcement budgets in LA County, just the big ones, not all 57 departments, but just the sheriffs, LAPD, the courts, uh, probation, um, and the district attorneys, that would give us $236 million a year. So we don't have a lack of resources. We're the 15th largest economy in the world. What we have is a lack of will. And when I started with that, if I'm out in the in the audience taking your chains and taking your purses, I want you to think about the fact that the county is making decisions every day and taking your money, and that we need to fight back and be vocal about what we want our money spent. And start with the marijuana tax revenue. Have 100% of that go to young people, since there hasn't been investment in young people so long, and that that's one industry that can now support young people that have been so devastated by the war on drugs. I do. I'm no, sorry. I, I just I want to get back to this question of feasibility, though. You know, uh, I've heard Dave say when he was up here, Kylie when she was standing, even both of y'all talk about how this process and this development of the LA model was a bit unique in a way. There were a lot of stakeholders who gave a lot of a lot of input, and I just I'm, I'm listening to what Dave's saying and what you're saying and what Fabian's saying, and I'm just wondering, you know, if how how feasible this is or what steps there are. Um, in terms of what happens next. I don't know if any of you can talk about the feasibility of that collaboration towards whatever goal. I think Kim talked a little bit about it. It's political involvement, um, talking to your constituents, being involved, um, 
telling them how you want the money invested, um, you know, and and supporting programs that are successful, and 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 Fabian talked a lot about it is accepting these kids into your industry and, and giving them a chance. Um, feasibility, you know, it starts in small pieces and grows. And, and, and like I said, we have to have success. And, and success breeds success. And, and LA County is huge. We're the largest probation department in the world. Um, and, and so making change is incremental but we have to have a vision. We have to have sustainability. You know, unfortunately, I've seen the cycle change from rehabilitation to incarcerating young people, and now we're back to rehabilitation. We can't lose, you know, that focus as a community. It's not probation, it's the community's issue. And what role do you think art has in kind of, you know, addressing that perception or that goal? Advocating for our youth, um, advocating for their uh, agencies, uh, I think, and I've talked to them a lot, you got to study what you're doing, uh, put a research design behind it, because when, like I said, when resources get thin, you have to be able to say, look at it, our effectiveness, because that's what sells when resources get thin, is what works. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would love to keep talking with all y'all about this for, for a while. There are a lot of questions that this raises, but I also know that the audience has been thinking and has a bunch of questions for you too. So my colleagues, Liz and Daphne, are gonna be running mics into the audience. If you've got a question or you wanna share an experience, raise your hand and they'll come to you. And just a little bit of instruction, as much as you can keep your questions and comments brief and concise, you wanna be able to hear from as many people as possible. Well, that makes me worried about what I'm going to say. Not um, to put you on the spot. No, it's OK. <laughs> I was a researcher at the University of Chicago for about 16 years. And Dyden went to heaven because I'd also been at the Department of Juvenile Justice prior to that. And I want to say that really the problem begins with the education system. Kids walk in the door, and most of the teachers expect them to fail. However, let me also say that out in communities, okay, I studied um, 300 of the best community organizations that were there for youth. Kids came for the activity and stayed for the adults. And they were things like tumbling teams, bicycle repair programs, youth run newspapers. Any arts? Yeah, and the arts, but the arts aren't the only thing. I mean, there are this variety of opportunities for kids where it's their interest that sparks their involvement. And opening it, I mean, your model is great, but opening it beyond that it is marvelous. So what I'm hearing in here, if I may jump in, is in terms of the education system and other roles other partners have in you know, providing this. Is that a fair? Well, yeah, I mean, youth development doesn't start in corrections. It starts when kids are in kindergarten. Um, I, I'm going to tailor this. I'm just going to say one more thing and shut up. But um, sorry, recording. Uh, I, I want to say one thing, and that is please don't hang your hat on research too early. Most funders want to see outcomes in two years or three years, and that's simply not realistic. If you can do descriptive research, fine. Stay away from outcomes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I noticed uh, when you were talking, you said subtle because they are not continuing to be degraded by what they haven't been taught. And the key for me, I taught within LAUSD for which is a system 64 years after Brown versus Board of Education that is still 90% black and Latino and no attempt is made to educate these kids. They are not given critical thinking skills. And what art does is it allows kids to enter and open up without being degraded. You take a kid and put him in an algebra class in the ninth grade, 
that still doesn't know his times tables because he's been socially promoted grade after grade after grade. I'm very impressed by what you guys are doing, but you gotta go to the source. LAUSD has a 52% chronic truancy rate. They make no attempt to educate those kids, and those kids are winding up having their lives destroyed. We have mandatory sentencing laws that are filling up our prisons. Prisons are owned by private corporations that are, that are putting workers to, you know, people in these prisons that have copped a plea because they don't want a mandatory sentence of 20 years. They take a five year and then they're working for a corporation that's running the prison. So I, I, I think that what has got to take place here is what you're doing with art has to be done with literacy. The bilingual brain is supposed to learn twice as fast as the monolingual brain. People whose ancestors built a civilization that lasted three times longer than the Roman Empire somehow got stupid. So I'm, what I'm hearing from, from both of you is this idea of education and its role in this conversation. I don't know if y'all can talk a little bit about you know, that role in how it was thought of in the LA model and arts as part of that education. Yeah, we looked at a um, couple things, you know, stabilizing their education, credit recovery, um, bringing them up to speed educationally as much as we can, uh, having a Road to Success Academy at our camp, but also education is greater than just reading, writing, and math, and, and, and that was one of the beauty of bringing the arts in. Uh, we also have vocational training, culinary arts, we're going to have a library, we're going to have a garden. So education is more about life education and not just the basics because some of these kids may never graduate from high school, however they may become an artist and they may gra gravitate towards Kim's organization and be gainfully employed in a different thing that we expose them to that made them think differently and have some success. I think it's also important to say that over the last 40 years with the, the new war on drugs, because of course the war on drugs is very old, and the new war on gangs, because that's also very old, um, we've moved, instead of having education and youth development move into the realm of courts and lockups, we've had lockups and courts and law enforcement move into the realm of education. So for any of us who came up after the 80s, we came into schools that looked and operated a lot like prisons, surrounded by razor wire and security gates, with more police officers on campus than counselors, with more emphasis on containment and control than on and, and te standardized testing, really, than on creativity and imagination and learning to be a critical thinker. And I want to give a lot of credit to all the community organizations and young people, youth organizers, and the teachers who were bold and courageous, and the, the, the school district personnel that have started to transform LA Unified and Compton Unified and Inglewood to become more like educational centers again. And not that they ever were, because we've never invested fully in education, but they're, they're getting more balanced in terms of that approach. And so there has been a huge drop in, for example, LA Unified through that organizing that communities and young people did, eliminated willful defiance as a suspension and suspensions just plummeted. We have the graduation rate because of that have gone from 40% of the students graduating to 60%. And so I think there's a lot of things that LA Unified and other big school districts have gotten right, and now there's a bill that young people are carrying across the state, Senate Bill 607, that would eliminate willful defiance suspensions. That's as many as 220,000 suspensions a year in California. So we need to take some of those practices. It's not, it, a lot has changed in like five, 10 years because of the organizing that's happening. And when we looked at suspension rates just last week, this is current data, right away, now data, the highest suspension rates in LA County are happening within LA County Office of Education. And all of the highest rated schools are the schools in lockups have very high suspension rates, even though small classrooms, about 10 students with a probation officer at the door, they're still kicking young people out of those, those classrooms. Um, and also the highest suspension rates are in those probation schools when young people come home. The data's there, they have to report on it. So I think we also should, this should be a two way, right? That there are schools that can learn a lot from what's happening about arts behind the walls, but there's also, people behind the walls that can, that can learn a lot from how schools and parents and teachers and young people are transforming themselves. Um, and if we think of it as like one group or one entity in LA having all the answers, I don't think we'll ever get to the vision we want. Um, I think that's just really, really crucial to say. That's interesting. Do we have any other questions in the audience?
but there we are. I think there's a stigma with arts education that it's a luxury and not a necessity because the value of providing an outlet for creative expression or a conduit for empathy can't be measured on a test. Mm -hmm. um, arts education, I think everyone who works in the, who's in the Arts for Incarcerated Youth Network would agree is a tremendous form of violence prevention and suicide prevention, but you can't prove a negative. <laughs> how do you prove what you've prevented? So how do you dispel that stigma with something that's so not necessarily quantifiable, but so valuable? I mean, I think that the data and the science is in, that when young people engage in music, they do better at math. Uh, that when young people are engaged in the visual arts, they become better business owners and better teachers. That arts is essential to our development in all other areas. And it's true what the woman said when she said, young people can't just have arts development. A youth development model or a community development model means that you're engaged in education and recreation and career um, and health, mental health and mental health and the arts. But for sure, the arts is essential in developing your other skills. And it's the only thing that separates us in evolution from other species, right? Our caves had drawings on them long before we advanced in other areas. And people painted their homes um, long before we had you know, mechanized vehicles. So the arts also gives us the creativity we need to invent and to imagine and to, and to evolve as a species. And it's the only thing to me that separates us from other species that are amazing and tremendous um, but haven't had that capacity to create in that same way. And Fabian, you're a, you're a practicing artist. Like, can you, maybe outcomes are hard to measure qualitatively or quantitatively. Can you do, you, do you have a vision of how they could be measured, like, in qualitatively? By giving them opportunities. That's man, I'm just saying, like, <laughs> by creating more opportunity, I don't think, you, I don't know, measure, measuring is asking too much of my youth sometimes, you know what I mean? Like, you know, it's bad enough they have all these external stressors, they've been asked to measure up all their life, and I think when it comes down to outcomes and evidence-based practices, to me that's a turnoff, uh, although that's the way the society works. Um, I think to me I'm just accustomed to working and uh, what, what's in front of me. If I can uplift the in, uh, youth one one at a time, then I'm doing my duty. Uh, I try not to get so caught up and consume with the evidence base and, 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 and data collecting because to me that defeats my purpose in a way. And so I personally just focus on what it is my calling and that's being present for that youth. And if I can help impact one youth at a time, then I'm, I'm, I'm changing the world. One, one youth at a time. That's why I stay grounded. I think it's also important to say that there's never been a family in the wealthier area of Pasadena where we're sitting right now, or on the wealthy white side, west side, um, that went into a ballet class and asked for an evidence-based study that ballet was important for their child, or that went into an art scene. You know, I mean, it's only young people of color coming up in the poorest communities that have to prove some scientific outcome to everything that they ask for. And I think so, that that's... Yeah, a conversation about the, the outcomes and the measurements. Uh, I think we had a... Um, my name is Obed. I am an English professor at East Los Angeles College. But before that, I was a, a gang member. Uh, I was also incarcerated. And you know, when you asked us to close your eyes and you started going through the description of the cell, I, I began to cry because it is a very painful experience. Um, now, this thing about perception, right? Our art, and when I say our, I'm talking about Latino youth, African American art, or any type of art that is not white, has for a long time been criminalized, right? And you know, just to make a, a, a point about what was said by the gentleman here about did an entire civilization just become dumb overnight? No, absolutely not, right? Uh, in that time span, there's been centuries of enslavement, of brutal oppression, and criminalization. If you go to East Los Angeles, you go to Boyle Heights, uh, a lot of the walls have these beautiful murals on them, uh, mm -hmm. these graffiti plaques on them, right? That for a long time was called criminal art, right? If you were caught creating this beautiful piece on the wall, you were probably arrested. And a lot of the youth that are incarcerated are incarcerated for you know, graffiti art. Uh, now it's become cool, it's become hip. Now you have the whole art district. Everybody, you know, people are getting paid to go do a piece on a wall mm -hmm. while our youth were being incarcerated. So this idea of perception of 
criminalizing. You know, going back to what Kim said, you know, a, a woman in Pasadena doesn't have to say, well, you know, show me the data that ballet works, right? We know that art works. It comes from curiosity. One of our first instincts to, when we are born is to be curious, right? Um, and from curiosity grows creativity. At some point, that creativity is stunted, especially in lower income minority communities. Yeah, that seems to be a theme among the conversation here. Dave, you look like you have Yeah, I just want to say a real quick plug. Uh, thank you. We, we currently have about 200 of our youth in halls and camps enrolled in either East LA or Mission College and, and taking college courses. And you talk about looking at kids differently, and we put a, a shirt on that says they're enrolled in college and stuff like that. And, I mean, I, I think a lot of people have alluded to this. The arts are a piece of this, and 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 but setting the expectations not too high, Fabian. But sometimes our kids are amazing what they will achieve. And and who would have thought that the camp system would have 200 kids enrolled in college in our juvenile halls? And and um, you know it's just the, the opportunity. And they do most of the classes online. But at Challenger Youth Memorial, and we're going to do this at uh, other facilities, we now have instructor-led courses in our facility. So I was glad to hear you're at East LA. Thank you. I think we just have time for about one more question. I do want to say that um, our panelists will hang out here for a few minutes afterwards, so you can um, bring your questions and comments to them there. Hi, um, Kim and Fabian, you seem to have a lot of passion and really creative ideas about how to change the system. Um, and Dave, you talk a lot, you're a public official, you talked a lot about po political will is the barrier, the main barrier. Because you guys, you're coming up with great ideas. You're saying there's feasibility within the amount of money we can save in restructuring. I mean, so there's obviously some type of divide here. And I was just wondering, Dave, as, um, as a public official, since political will is something that you focused on, how do you think, like how do you fit within that model? Um, how do you make political will as a public official? And on top of that, how do you include Kim and Fabian in an, ex in an executive in an official manner to get what they're saying actually, uh, you know, actualized, actualized? Does that make sense? Yes, I think so. Um, <laughs> creating political will, you do it within your organization, and then you know you do it with the justice deputies, you do it with the board members, um, you, you fight for what you believe in. Um, you have to be an advocate yourself. It, it's, it, you know, I'm, an, I'm a bureaucrat stuck in an advocate's body sometimes. And, and um, you have to have passion for what you do. You have to believe that the work is still good and it's right. Um, and then sometimes you have to take chances. Um, you know, I signed Fabian's, um, I did a provisional clearance on him, what, what we do. <laughs> and, 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 you know, our organization was so not used to doing those things, and, 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 our, and our chief and our assistant chief said, we're going to use credible messengers in this organization. So I took that, and, and part of, they were creating political will for us to do that. And, and, and work, you know, and change the culture in probation as far as, you know, th we're going to do business differently. And you can create political will on a uh, local level. You know, I start with my organization and, and, and try to keep myself out of trouble and, and, and really advocate on behalf of what I think is right for our kids. And, and that's an internal value I have. Um, I, I want our kids to succeed. And you know, if I believe in something, I'm going to stick up for it. And sometimes it may not be popular, and may not be the the soup du jour. But um, you know, I know when I see our kids, and I know when they're interacting, if they're enjoying it, if they're getting something out of it, um, if it's good for them. You know, we we can ask them. Kids are remarkably honest. You know, do you enjoy this? intervention and and we get those that feedback i think that's a good forward-looking question to end on so uh, i want to thank dave mitchell from the la county probation department kim with youth justice coalition and fabian and kylie from the arts for incarcerated youth network and uh,
I also want to thank the KPCC in-person team. They've been really great to work with on this event. And they actually have a bunch of other events. So we hope you'll keep in touch with KPCC and KPCC in person and, and join us for another event soon. On your way out, you'll notice we have some images that uh, the Arts for Incarcerated Youth Network brought to kind of show this work in action. Um, we'll be here to talk, chat, answer some questions. And thanks again for coming. Have a good night.